All right, guys, we are here with Thomas DeLauer, one of the premier health and fitness diet, I don't know, just overarching broad spectrum, high quality health content that I've seen on the internet to date. And thanks for, thanks for being here, yeah, dude. Bad brother. Yeah. So today, I wanted to talk about omega-3s because this is a very nuanced discussion as far as how do you even know if what you're getting is going to help you or hurt you? Should you be having it? Should you not be having it? It is, is it as impactful on cardiovascular health as we've been led to believe? Or is it, you know, always rancid and you're going to screw yourself up if you use it? So I've seen some of your content and it does get very, very nuanced. And there's even people who out there who say that you shouldn't even have omega-3s at all because they're problematic. And there's the omega-6 to 3 ratio and all this stuff. But I guess first off like i've seen some of your grocery store hauls and some of the stuff you've done where you kind of like break down what's good or bad in terms of nutrition content like rancidity versus not like what would be kind of the first thing you would say as far as is an omega-3 supplement beneficial and if so in what context do you think it would be beneficial like is it only for people who don't eat fish and they should eat fish or do you think that it's beneficial even for people to be I don't know, like in what context do you think it's yeah. relevant and applicable? I mean, I used to be the guy that was all about mega dosing fish oil. So, I mean, I have to like fall on the sword a little bit and say, okay, I think that I've, I've come around from that. I used to think like mega dosing fish oil because massive brain benefits, massive, you know, cardio benefits, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll first kind of disclaimer there. I don't think that's necessarily the case anymore. Like quelling inflammation that much with an anti-inflammatory compound can be detrimental for cardiovascular health as well, right? So, um, yeah, when you're walking into a Costco, most of the stuff on the shelves is bullshit. Like, most of it is is garbage. But that's not to say, like, if you're looking for a fish oil, what you should be paying attention to in sort of a hierarchy of, like, what's most important. First off, has nothing to do with the ingredients necessarily. It's to look more so, like, is it coming from small fish, right? Because sometimes they will actually pull omega-3s from larger fish and just kind of pull it together and make really crappy compounds. So that's like first rule number one is like, it should be coming from like anchovies, should be coming like from an area like Chile or something like that, where it's gonna be like a little bit like cooler water off the coast there. That's typically what you wanna aim for. That's kind of beside the point. When you get down into the granular of it, you have two sides of the equation with omega-3s so when you're looking at a supplement. If you look on the bottle, it's gonna say EPA and DHA, right? Like EPA is echo uh, or DHA is docosahexaenoic acid and EPA is uh, echosinoic. So basically the difference between these two is EPA is supposed to be more anti-inflammatory for the body, right? DHA is more skewed for the brain. First off, you typically want to be leaning towards one that's higher DHA, skewed a little bit more towards the DHA side. So if you're looking at a label, if you're like a thousand milligrams EPA and a hundred milligrams DHA or something like that, that's a pretty bad ratio. You know, I try to get that DHA content up and it's usually indicative of the quality of the fish oil too, as sort of a backdoor way of saying that. Because a lot of times like they'll, basically you can see if it's gonna be high EPA and low DHA, unless you have a very specific use case for EPA only, mm -hmm. like it, it doesn't make any fucking sense. Like it doesn't like, like the whole idea of getting like fish oil for the most part, it's cardiovascular health yeah. and brain benefit. What's the ratio of the one that you're using right now? So I try to find like a one-to-one -one or typically, personally, I use cod liver oil. Now, okay. the reason that I use cod liver oil, it goes down a different vein, right? I am not the biggest fan, and this is personal, like no one has to take this to the bank. I don't like taking a lot of like synthetic vitamin D, right? Because I try, I, I come from the school of thought that like, okay, well, vitamin D can disrupt, uh, you know, what's called like, basically uh, retinol A. So you like, have this balance of vitamin D, vitamin A, they all kind of work together in the immune system. Vitamin D, vitamin A are very important together. And when you start taking in too much vitamin D, you get a, a depletion of a retinol, bioavailable retinol A. What that means is you can disrupt sort of this cycle within the immune system and it could actually have a detrimental effect. That being said, full disclaimer, if you're very low vitamin D, get your vitamin D up to where it needs to be, even if that does mean via a synthetic route. But for me, I take cod liver oil because it's got a good ratio of vitamin D3 to vitamin A, and then just the right amount of reesterified triglyceride form uh, omega-3. And what that means is, like with that, it's usually a one-to-one -one or a two-to-one ratio of DHA to EPA, which you're not gonna find in a typical fish oil. And what I mean by that is like, if you go into a Costco, um, you're probably not going to find one that has a higher ratio of DHA to EPA. But ones you do wanna look for that are gonna get you closest to that are gonna be cod liver oil, but it's going to be a lower quantity overall. Mm -hmm. So it's a good ratio, but the quantity of omega-3s is lower in cod liver, so you'd have to take more of it. But it's in what is called a, uh, an 
reesterified triglyceride. So if you look at a label of a fish oil pill, you're going to see that it's usually in ethyl ester form. So it'll say it somewhere in the label, it'll be like in ethyl ester or, or ethyl esterified, right? That goes rancid. That is what goes rancid. When it's in a stable triglyceride form, the fish oil is much more protected. It's much more like getting it from the real fish versus a suspended polyunsaturated fat. So those are kind of like the high marks you want to look for. You want to be looking for, okay, higher DHA content. You want to be looking for uh, it to not have the words ethyl ester if possible, okay? And then you also want to, you know, kind of look at, okay, what's the location? What's the region? And then really have to ask yourself, what's the goal? Like, should you be mega dosing this stuff? And then that comes down to like, again, depends what you're after. Like if you're trying to get a brain benefit, most of the literature suggests that you do need to be at a higher dosage of DHA to get that effect. So if you were like APOE4, what would you be taking versus just somebody who is trying to get a cardiovascular benefit out of it? Yeah, so yeah, if you're APOE4, then obviously you have different risk factors. So usually you want to be taking in more DHA. It's hard to say a specific amount, but you know, in that you might want to be considering like maybe upwards of 3,000 milligrams per day, upwards okay. of three grams a day, which sounds like a lot, but it's really not when you think about how much is in a capsule, right? Yeah. Uh, so I used to say, there was a time when I was like mega dosing like 10 grams of fish oil per day. And I was convinced that it was like really doing a lot of good things because there was such cool literature on- So you this. cut yourself, you just bleed to death? <laughs> yeah, seriously. I mean, it was just, the literature was pretty strong in a lot of places, but a lot of it, but it was still fairly mechanistic. And it was like, like insulin sensitivity on um, muscle mass and all of this. And arguably my brain felt like really, really, really good. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when I brought, dropped the dose down to like three, four grams per day, like I didn't lose much brain effect. Mm -hmm. So I'm a firm believer that like start with the lowest amount possible, kind of work your way up and then kind of work your way down until you find that kind of magic sweet spot. But everybody's different. Everybody like someone that's going to have a higher degree of inflammation might be better off with a higher dose of it. Mm -hmm. But if it's rancid, I mean, then you're doing yourself more harm. And there's guys like Jay Feldman that are kind of talking about that now where it's saying, okay, if you have a rancid fish oil or a rancid omega-6 or a rancid polyunsaturated fat in the first place, that's gonna be more detrimental than any potential benefit you get from it. So do you think that most of the fish oil supplements that are available are more harmful than helpful? It's a good question. Like for example, if I go to Costco, they have like, you know, their Kirkland brand or some of these other at scale, like probably, pretty, they at least write on the label, like very, very regulated and what kind of standards they're adhering to, et cetera. But in general, like, I don't know, like how would you? Yeah, I'd say if you walk into the average store, I don't necessarily want to put Costco on the spot, but if you walk into the standard <laughs> store, yeah. most of them are probably doing more harm than good. Okay. Yeah, but that's not to say that a good omega-3 doesn't do you good, right? Yeah. It's, and I don't want to get on my high horse and just like tout cod liver oil, but I just think that cod liver oil is like the most stable form that you can get. What about krill oil? So krill oil is, is nice because, okay, the further you get down kind of the food chain, the more stable it is as far as, uh, you know, being exposed to toxins in the water. Because that matters too, right? If it's like, if you've got a fish that's been swimming around in the ocean with a crap load of shitload of fucking radiation and whatever shit's going on in there, yeah. it's going to absorb it, right? So a smaller fish or a smaller animal as you get further down the food chain, shorter life expectancy of those animals, and they're also just smaller, and some like krill have an exoskeleton that actually help protect them from that. So it makes a difference. Uh, so krill is a pretty safe bet. As far as rancidity goes, it's usually protected from that too. Um, is that from the S, the yeah, salmon? Yeah, which is a very interesting category. Like, so salmon oil too, but salmon, salmon's kind of gone to shit now too. Like, you know, like, I don't know if I'd fully trust salmon oils. But the astaxanthin, yeah, that protects it. So like with a salmon, for instance, it's pretty fascinating. When a salmon is swimming upstream, the reason it has, the reason a salmon has astaxanthin and turns, gets that pink color is because it's literally protecting the salmon from the oxidative stress of its strenuous workout going upstream. So presumably you couldn't take a otherwise seen as not ideal ethyl ester format just with astaxanthin with it? Yeah, you could. And that you think would neutralize the yeah, and I guess problematic component? Because as think so. if you're looking at the nutritional facts, if a, you have a krill oil, it's like you've got to have like half a bottle of it to equate to a handful of a normal ethyl ester that is very, very potent. Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a good question. And yeah, I think, I think you're accurate. I think that, you know, for the lay person, sometimes like if you're having to combine things, it just confuses them. They uh -huh. just want it like a one-stop shop. But yes, I think combining astaxanthin with uh, fats that you're concerned that could be oxidized could help you protect that. 
uh, it, or at least negate some of the negative effects or protect you from some of the negative effects. Another one that's kind of interesting is... So that's literally popping ethyl ester fish oil that's highly concentrated with an astaxanthin and suggesting that it might be protected. It might be, like, right, I'm fully speculating okay. based on, like, it makes sense, it would make sense, right? Because astaxanthin, definitely, that's one of the reasons why the omega-3s in salmon are usually a little bit more stable. Because as much as I've heard Rhonda Patrick tout the benefits of krill oil and this and that, I'm like, damn, like, even for me, this is cost prohibitive as hell. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, there's another one called calamarine oil, which comes from, like, calamari, it comes from squid. Okay. And that's a pretty good ratio. That's a really good ratio of DHA to EPA, too. And they have a very short life. So those are usually pretty safe, too. So that's a good one to look for as well. Huh. So cod liver oil, are you literally getting it in liquid format? So, I mean, I, no, I get it in capsule format. Okay. So, and it's, again, you're not going to have an ethyl ester form with cod liver oil. So it's, yeah. it's almost always going to be, it is always going to be in a re-esterified triglyceride. Mm. Um, and usually with that, you've got what are called pro-resolving mediators. Uh, pro-resolving mediators are you're able to essentially counterbalance inflammatory and anti-inflammatory effects. So mm -hmm. just like the name implies, it's, it's proactively resolving sort of this mediation that occurs between prostaglandins and kind of the hormone ba or inflammation balance. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hmm. So for you, cod liver oil, is this something that you can buy at a local place or is it always the... The supplements available are all essentially ethyl ester format in grocery stores. In the no, world. I think you can definitely find them. Like, I mean, I, I can't go on record and say one specific store more than others, but I, I mean, I will say like Sprouts, uh, okay. like, I don't know if you're up in Canada, but Sprouts, like it's a kind of regional stores, like out in like California, Arizona, I think some in Texas, stuff like that. They have some that are in reesterified triglyceride form, you know, and it's tough because should you be getting it from your diet? I just don't see us getting that. Well, first off, let me back up and say, the whole one-to-one -one ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 as the ideal, that's fucking bullshit. Like, <laughs> who the hell is going to do that? Like, even, even if you are a Viking, like, living in fucking Denmark. <laughs> okay. Like, like, I just don't, I, I just don't, see, like, I don't see that happening. Like, a one-to-one -one ratio, like, you'd have to, like... No, it seems impossible. No. And, and, but what is messed up is, like, when you look at what we consume in the United States... We're like a 45 to 1 mm -hmm. omega-6 to the omega-3 ratio. That is bad, right? That being said, like the omega-6s, there's been like this regression to the mean. Maybe they're not as bad as we once thought they were. But I don't think that we need to be relying on omega-3s as much as we thought before. I almost try to look at them as more of an optimization piece. So I don't, I don't know if I'd go on record and say there's like as much crazy cardiometabolic benefit as we once thought. I like to look at omega-3s as like almost an optimization strategy now because it is a, like a significant improvement I feel in terms of like mental clarity and things like that when I take it. Um, there's also pretty interesting evidence on uh, like kind of muscle sparing effect, insulin sensitivity. So I look at it from like as an athlete, I'm like, okay, is this helping me? Am I getting more benefit than I am detriment uh, for my performance and for my mental performance? And the answer for that is typically yes. What was the dose? I think it was, uh, is it the reduce it trial? That was the, the really impactful study that showed like the cardio. Oh yeah. That was like, yeah, the one that was like however many years ago, right? That was yeah. like, yeah, that was in Rhonda Patrick's talked about that one. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember the dose that was used? No, no, uh, no. Do you know the type of fish oil that they use? No, not at all. Okay. Hmm. It's... So cod liver oil and krill oil, you would say are superior, but the cod liver oil, is that also faced with the same issues as the krill where to get a couple thousand milligrams, like you're having a quarter of the bottle per day kind of thing? Yeah, but it comes with like the balance of having those other compounds in it that all synergistically work together. Okay. Everything that I talk about, I'm always trying to go back to like, what is the most feasible way to get this in the most bioavailable form in a non-isolated way as possible? Mm -hmm. Because I believe in the synergistic effect of, of especially like fat soluble vitamins. Like they're yeah. designed to be consumed like in its entirety. Like if you were to go eat liver or you were to go eat something like what are, what are all the things you're getting together? Because there, there has to be some synergy for us in a biological sense, right? So like if there's benefits to liver, I mean, liver king says there's benefits to liver. So there must be benefits to liver because everything says, it. no, never mind. <laughs> and, but, but also the cod liver, you're getting oil from the liver itself, right? So yeah. you're getting like sort of these effects in a concentrated way. So one could make the argument that like, okay, well maybe along with these, like you're enhancing the uptake of the omega-3s and using it in a form that's 
more readily available for the body. Mm -hmm. You know, somewhat speculative, but that's kind of how I live my life. I try to be like, okay, can I minimize the amount of like exogenous like things coming in in isolation so that I can control variables better. All right, so hopefully you guys found that educational, informative, insightful. Um, I haven't really dug into the nuances around fish oil on my channel before, and um, I feel like Thomas is one of the foremost experts on a lot of things when it comes to nutritional literature, and um, hopefully you guys learned something. Appreciate having you on, man. Sure. And uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed that, learned something, and I'll talk to you guys soon.